Does anybody recognize any of these faces on here? Because they're part of the reason why I'm here as well. Who's this person here? Anybody recognize that person? So that is Tony Jenkins, lovely guy. Tony Jenkins was the ex, was the education director for World Beyond War before I took over in November. But Tony Jenkins, you'll probably know him, he is the coordinator for the Global Campaign for Peace Education also. And I'm going to say a little bit more about Tony later, but you obviously know these two as well because I believe they've been doing a lot of great work with you. Josephina Norbert. And the reason why I got in contact with them is because of this person, Ed Rantmere, who I was in the US and he said, Phil, it'd be great if you can come along and do some talks for our students about the work that you did. While I was there, he said, oh, and by the way, can you write a chapter based on some of the work that you've been doing? So he's got a book coming out, and I believe Hillary, you and Kevin Kester also have a, uh, a chapter in that book, don't you? Yeah. So I want to say thank you to all these, and they also send their regards as well. So that's a good kind of starting point. Here's the flow of what we want to look at. I want to really look at, to start with, what do we mean by young people? What do we mean by peace building? How do we go about engaging them? I want to give a bit of context, a bit of context for the way in which I come at this work and the kind of work that I've been doing over the years. But the focus really is on this part, looking at how we go about engaging young people in peace building activities. And really today revolves around this, a model. A model of engaging young people, a model that puts young people at the center of peace building activities, but also engages communities as well, where young people lead the projects and adults guide and mentor the projects. That's our task, and I want to try and reflect on a few, a few implications, a few key messages that I found. And I've got to be, I come at this as very much a practitioner working towards a scholar practitioner. So my reflections are based on practice, but a lot of reflective practice, thinking about what I'm doing. Um, I've got to say a little bit about World Beyond War. So World Beyond War is a global movement to end the war system. So not end war in Syria, not end the war in Afghanistan, end the war system. A massive project, I know. We have a membership in 175 countries. We have chapters and affiliates all around the world that we work with. We have two focuses of our organization. One, education, so educating people about and for war abolition and peace education, and action, actually out on the street, getting people involved, protesting, campaigning, and things like this. A couple of things worth bearing in mind is our educational work has won the Educators Challenge Awards, and we got presented with it last year at the London School of Economics. Based on our study guide, we have a load of resources online. I really recommend go and checking it out. Um, and here's one that might be of interest. Tony and I are talking about our blueprint book, which is the Alternative Global Security System, on the 19th of February. So there's one for your, your diaries. And we're also running currently a free online, uh, online course called War Abolition 101, which looks at everything to do with the war system and how we go about challenging the war system. Please sign up for the Peace Pledge. One entry point into our work is by signing our peace pledge. So I'm going to hand this around, have a look at it. Please feel free to sign it if I can pass it to Basma. So there's a bit of context. Um, also, I want to say as well, hopefully we have time, that I want to see this really as a way of collaborating moving forward. Um, with Tony, as you know, he heads the Global Campaign for Peace Education. Since I've come back to the UK, and I'll say a little bit about that shortly, I'm looking at putting together a country mapping of what's happening in the UK with regards to peace education. You have wonderful expertise and knowledge in this area. It would be lovely if we could collaborate on this together. Um, a few other things. I'd like to speak about a whole school approach where I'm living. I'm from Shropshire, by the way. I don't know if... Hands up if you know where Shropshire is. Okay, okay. <laughs> so Shropshire's kind of one hour away from Birmingham, and I'm working with the school there, and we've got commitment to look at a whole school approach to building peace and well-being. And I come at this 
um, this work as a peace builder, but also as a therapist as well. So I'm very interested in questions of well-being and how we go about implementing this well-being in schools. We've got commitment to do a whole school approach, training all of the school, which is the biggest school in Shropshire, and the teachers as well. So I'd love to have a conversation and other projects coming up. I want to say a little bit about, OK, so how did I get into this work? And how do I come at this work that I do? Broadly, my, my background's in, in four different areas. The first 10 years of my life, I worked for the government as a youth worker. In detached youth work, youth offending prisons, out on the streets, in youth clubs, and things like this. I also trained as a therapist. So I was the therapist in my area, working from a person-centered approach, for those of you that might know that, working with young people and working with the community. More recently, I did my, my um, training in education, um, so my master's, my PGC and PGCHE, looking at education. And then in the last seven years, it's been a real focus on peace education. Um, I did my PhD at the uh, University of Kent, um, looking at contextualizing peace education programs, how we go about developing programs in a way that Hillary touched on earlier that works with the communities. There's a massive issue I see in the peace field that lots of pro projects and programs are imposed on these local communities without actually asking them, what should peace education look like in your context and how can we work together to go about developing this? Although there's four different areas, there's a real thread through everything that I do with regards to trying to have a good mix of practitioner experience with academic study. So trying to really bridge this gap between theory and practice, which is a big one in our field, which is a big one in lots of fields. And I really try and look at this idea of how do we work on the inner elements of change. So this idea is specifically in peace education, inner peace, and also outer elements of peace as well. Out of all that, these are two things that really, really drive my work. One is this person, Carl Rogers, who for me is my hero, and I've taken his work when I first trained as a therapist into what I do as a peace builder, what I do as a peace educator. He is the founder of, it was originally called client-centered therapy, but he's very much informed what we would call here as educators the student-centered approach to learning versus the teacher-led approach to learning. I'm also very much informed by this, this, this person, but more in particular, Patrick's projection research, this idea of doing research with communities rather than about them or for them. And Patrick's Action Research is informed by many different people, but one is Kurt Lewin, or Kurt Lubin, however you see it. But I like two, two of his, um, his phrases, which I think really sum up the way in which I look at things. One is, there is nothing so practical as a good theory. Okay, so what do I mean by that? As a practitioner, I've got to say, lots of practitioners often look down on theory sometimes. I think theory can be very, very useful. And I found it useful in the sense that I can take a theoretical underpinning or an understanding to different places that I work, and it allows me to have a lens through which to try and make sense of what I'm doing. So that's the idea. Nothing so practical as a good theory. The other thing that he says is, paraphrasing, um, nothing, but, nothing but books will suffice. Okay? So basically, he's making a call that our research should produce more than books, should produce more than articles. It should be there to try and make a change for what's happening on the ground as well. And in order to do that, I really love this idea of participatory action research. Hillary, I didn't think that I'd speak in depth about that. I'd love to come back and talk about it again. I'm happy to come back and do a session on participatory action research. But the idea is participation done with local communities, done with young people, action, it actually involves taking action, reflecting on that action, and then rechanging your work or redesigning your work. And obviously, research is the rigorous element of it. Patrick's be action research. There's a little bit about me, but can I ask you to do something? Close your eyes, please. And think of a peace builder. Think of a peace builder, okay? So when you think of peace building, this is my hero, this is my peace builder, okay? Put your hand up if you've got one in mind. You can still keep your eyes closed. Put your hand up if you've got one in mind. 
Okay, so a peace builder. Okay, perfect. You can open your eyes now. Put your hand up if you thought of one of these people. Ooh, okay. Okay. Put your hand up if you thought of maybe one of these. Okay, I'm really curious. So you thought of, who did you think of? Okay. And what makes Milana a peace builder for you? Okay. Like, I don't, I don't really like you doing the word peace because that's a bit of a wild statement, but it's just like when I thought of peace builder, I thought of her. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. okay, okay, thank you, okay. So I'm really curious. Uh, when I do this in other places, many people are like, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and things like this, but so no hands went up. So I'm really curious. Can I ask if you can just shout out who you were thinking of as a peace builder? Um, I work with young people in the Central African Republic. So. Okay, so were you thinking of one or a group or a person? Okay, perfect. Uh, previous teacher I worked with. Okay, oh, wonderful. Okay. I get from my beliefs, so Jesus. As a okay, Jesus, perfect. Similarly, previous teacher. Okay. Oh, okay, great. Okay. My mom. My mom, okay, great. So I'd love to hear stories. I love this, you know. So some people do think of people like that, like Gandhi, and Bell Hooks, and people like that. But also, yeah, personally, my mom is a peace builder. So with that in mind, I often think that we don't think of young people enough as peace builders. We often think of them as, as problems to be solved, okay? And I think that that needs to change. So. What I want to try and make an argument for today, but also show you how we go about doing this in some little way, is how we go about engaging, educating, and equipping young people to be peace builders. How we go about doing that. But before we do so, what do we mean by youth? What do we mean by youth work? What do we mean by peace building? It's very important to define our terms. So this is my, so when we think of youth, again, youth means different things to it, different people. If you look at the United Nations understanding, they would say 15 to 24. If you go to some African countries, they would go up to 35, 40. The way in which I think about young people is teens up to 29. Okay, so that's one way of understanding young people. And again, it's context specific. So is peace education, so is peace building, but I want to offer a frame for how, how to understand it. I think Good, good youth work, good youth peace building work should be educational. It will take place in informal, non-formal, and formal settings. And it will be empowering in the sense that really at the core, it's about relationships. I think that's very, very uh, central and about the environment that you provide for people to, to make changes in the way that they want to make changes. I put here, it's about participation, but purposeful participation. So I'm going to say a little bit about that shortly. And a hybrid, it's about and Paolo Freire would often talk about this, you go and you meet young people or people where they are, but you also offer them opportunities to gain things as well and allow them to actually move themselves from where they are if they want. So meet them where they're at, but also offer opportunities to move beyond that. Peace building, again, means different things to different people. Here is one way of understanding it. Um, any and all activities to reduce violent conflict and advance peace through peaceful means. Everybody has a task to play in peace building. Johann Gelfand said, the father of peace studies. So it could mean this, peacekeeping. So when I'm talking about peace building, I'm including peacekeeping, peacemaking, and peace building under the umbrella. It could mean this. Has anybody seen this picture before? Yeah, isn't it wonderful, isn't it? So I was, I was, in, I was asked to talk at a, a session and I said, is that real? You know, and this is in Thailand. And, they, and a person there actually went, yeah, and I helped organize it. One million people get together to do this. How cool is that? Peace building. Bolivia. Um, spent more than three years in Bolivia. Um, actually, my wife over here, if I can just point out, is from Bolivia as well. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. But I spent uh, more than five years on the ground in, in um, South America. Um, they use conflict, as Lederach would say, as a motor of change. They don't see conflict as something bad. They see conflict as a motor of change, and they're out on the streets protesting, trying to bring about changes to the status quo. But I also think of peace building like this. What a lovely picture of dog. Peace building, at the end of the day, is about relationships, I think. Relationships is key. Okay? And at the end of the day as well, although we have the Sustainable Development Goals, 
and the youth peace building agenda. All peace building work has to be local. Although we'll have policies and procedures to inform work, it has to be local. Before, I, before we move on to this idea of the context for why youth peace building is important, can you put your hands up if you've seen Dragon's Den? Okay, so what do they do on Dragon's Den? What they do is that they come in and they're very nervous and they kind of make a pitch and say, give me your money, you know, and things like this. So I thought we'd try it here. This is the kind of thing that I do with young people as well. So basically what you're going to be asked to do is, you meet Boris Johnson in the lift and you've heard about, there's been a load of money cut from the youth service in England. This is not good, okay? You have an opportunity to speak to Boris Johnson and make your elevator pitch. You have 60 seconds to make this elevator pitch. And what you want to look at is three reasons why young people are not being trained to be peace builders, three reasons why this is wrong, and three ways professionals working with young people can support young people to be peace builders. So can we try 10 minutes? Do you think you'd do 10 minutes? Let's do 10 minutes and see what you can come up with. Remember the idea is to be really catchy and, and really to the point, okay? And please work in your table groups. So maybe we've got one table here, one table here, one table here. Okay, everyone. Thank you so much for that. I would love to come round and hear you do your elevator pitches. Um, in terms of timing, we don't have time, so don't worry, you're not going to be put on the spot to do your elevator pitch in 60 seconds. But I loved walking round and listening to some great engaging discussions going on. And I was busy writing some notes of some of the things that stuck out. And hopefully some of the things that we're going to touch on as we move forward. So I was hearing over here with regards to, well, actually, I think there's an, uh, there's an issue with the education system itself. It's set up as, let's say, a manufacturing line, as Sir Ken Robinson would say, or a commodity. Um, I also heard um, issues around, well, actually, adults think that they have the answer, and young people don't have the answer, and adults are there to tell young people what to do. I ho also heard issues with regards to agency, um, and we'll be looking at that shortly, what we mean by agency. Um, also the idea of negative, positive agency and things like this. I also heard this idea of um, if we put young people at the centre of peace building work, it actually means that some of us might have to give up some of our power, right? And you were talking about power, which is very, very important when you think about working with young people. So it, it means giving up some of your power or negotiating it. It's not to say you have power and you don't. It's about understanding where the power lies in that relationship. I heard some interesting discussions here with regards to an interesting program called Youth Empowerment Program. So you oh, you just found it. OK. Google has the answer. Um, I, I heard some interesting discussions also with regards to, actually, we're looking at peace building, but there's links here to mental health as well and well-being as well. So the connection says something there about the connection between peace education and social and emotional learning. So very, very interesting discussions going on. Hopefully, some of those things we're going to touch on as we move forward. This is an activity that we do with young people, and they love it, and they come up with so many creative ideas, and they love doing their pitches, and what we actually do is that we film them, um, and then they put all their pitches on a site that people can look at, and things like this. It's great. I want to say a little bit about the context of youth and peace building. And I think actually there's, there's a, both a policy and practice context, looking at the global right through to the local. So if you look at the global level, why is there all this interest around youth and peace? Well, you've got the sustainable development goals for starters, come out in 2015. Peace is one of the 17 goals However, it's very, very fundamental in terms of progress on all of the 17 goals. Why is that? Because the UN General Secretary said there can be no peace without, without sustainable development. There can be no sustainable development without peace. So it's recognised now that peace is really at the core. If we want to make progress in other areas, education, climate change, and things like this, what we need to do is tackle, and I would say, coming with my hat on, tackle the war system, tackle violence, because when there's violence, when there's war, 
it diverts attention away from favourable things such as education, such as climate change and things like this. Youth, peace and security has also been a massive issue since 2015. Um, the UN brought out its new resolution, 2250, which basically says all member states need to step up their game with regards to involving young people more in decision-making and action related to peace and security. The reason why they did that is because they found that a lot of the work in peace and security was done to young people, not done with them. Okay? So this is a follow-up from 15 years ago, from the 1325 UN resolution, which basically said... Women have been left out of discussions and decision-making and action with regards to peace and security. I was looking more recently about um, progress in the region as well, and I was interested, what are the priorities now in Europe, now that they've come back after being away from, for many years? And I found out that the um, Council of Europe Youth Sector, which has an um, oversight for youth work in the region, has put down three of its priorities as this access to rights, youth participation and youth work, getting young people involved, active citizenship, inclusive and peaceful societies, wasn't there before. So talk about engaging young people in peace work has very much increased and there's so many more people, agencies, policies that are talking about it. If we look at the national level, and there's an interesting thing and I'll share a little bit of a story, since I came back, um, I met with many of the people I used to work with for the government and things like this, and they said, that is so cool, Phil, the stuff you've been doing elsewhere. We need that here. My initial reaction was, I don't really think kind of Shropshire where I am is kind of Colombia or Brazil or Bolivia or the US and places like that that I've been. But the more I looked into it, there's been some, there's some real issues, some real challenges right now with regards to peace and security in the UK. I mean, you look at knife crime, all-time high. You look at issues with regards to county lines. Does that ring a bell to anybody? County lines? Okay. So county lines is about this idea of drugs, basically, and manipulating young people in particular to be kind of the person taking the drugs and moving it on. It's gone from urban areas through to rural areas. So where I am in Shropshire is very, very rural. And actually, if you think about it in terms of the geography, it's kind of like the epicenter for for this kind of work. So it's a real issue. Um, mental health, wherever I go, is an issue as well. So I think there's, there's a context at the global, regional, national, and local level. Youth, youth, youth work has been cut since I left 10 years ago as a youth worker. Austerity has cut lots of funding with regards to youth work in particular, although that's changing, and hopefully Boris will help that change, but let's see. I heard a few other things about well, is it worth it? Is there a return on investment? Well, actually, research shows that peace building doesn't just save lives. It actually saves money as well. Um, and th this research comes from the Institute for Economics and Peace. Well, first of all, as a starting point, you can see that it's 14.1 trillion. Um, it's the global impact of violence. Two trillion is spent on militarism. We're at a 30-year high in terms of violence and violent conflict. And this bit at the end here is quite interesting. For every dollar invested now, the cost of conflict would be reduced by $16. This is an estimate brought about through the work done by the Institute for Economics and Peace. So there's a little bit more about the frameworks, this one in particular. So great work is being done. There's some amazing work being done by really, really innovative scholars. Generally, you can think of the role of young people in peace building in four different ways. One is that they're victims of violence. There's a lot of research on that. In particular, I'd point out people like uh, Mark Summers, um, Alan Smith, etc. A lot of work being done on that, a lot of great work. And they also talk about young people as perpetrators of violence as well. A lot of work done around that area as well. In the context of this idea of a youth bulge, where there's more young people, scholars have argued that where there tends to be more young people, we can see that there tends to be more violence. And there is research, a set of literature that actually does make that argument. I think these two we know a lot less about. Young people tend to be thought of as kind of irrelevant sometimes and labelled as this. These are not my labels. <coughs> labelled as irrelevant, as in oh, we kind of forget about them. That's been particularly interesting for me to look at, being back in my rural area of Shropshire, where young people are very excluded. 
very, very excluded. So they don't really, they're not really in the conversation. They're kind of out the way, irrelevant, and things like that. But they're not, they're not victims or perpetrators, but they're excluded. We know a lot less about young people as peace builders. So these first three, Basma, in terms of your discussion about agency, we could look at these three in terms of really a negative view of agency, how we go about looking about young people. Often, it's, it's things that are done to young people, where if you look at young people as peace builders, it's a positive view of their agency. How do they go about using their agency to try and bring about change through getting involved with peace research, through getting involved with peace education, through actually, and you, I heard this here as well, taking what they've done in the classroom and actually trying to make a difference in the community. How do they go about using their agency to do that? Well, I think there's two ways they can do it in terms of peace building. One is explicitly taking what they've done in terms of peace education and going out into the communities and doing projects. Explicit engagement with peace building. But they need a platform to do that. So I think this idea of implicit engagement is really, really important. The adults and professionals working with young people have a really, really important role to play in setting that environment, in enabling that space for young people to feel trusted, for young people to feel safe, for young people to feel empowered. I often hear this idea of, and I have some issues with it, about we are there to empower young people. I don't like that way of thinking about it. I think we're there to provide an environment for young people to empower themselves. We're not there to go out and empower other people. Here's some of the things as a practitioner, working towards practitioner scholar, which I find some of the challenges that still exist, but also some of the things that we can do to try and effectively address these challenges. And I've tried to put it in a nice way in terms of peace to make it kind of easy to understand. Purposeful participation. Research shows, and that Graham Simpson was the author of The Missing Peace. After the UN 2250 was brought out in 2015, they wanted to do some research to find out, well, to what extent are we making progress with this resolution? Because as we know, the big challenge is moving from policies to how is it operationalized on the ground? Graham Smith did some research with over 4,000 young people in 40 different countries and basically found out that young people are still getting left out of decision making. And he comes up with this term, violence of exclusion. They're still excluded from decision making processes. They might be involved in terms of, okay, you're participating, but you're just telling me what you think. I think this idea of purposeful participation should be something we should be looking for. What do we mean by purposeful participation? Well, look at research. Most research in whatever field is done about young people or for them. There's a lot less, there's some great work being done by the way, there's a lot less done with young people. Training young people themselves to be researchers and young people going out there and conducting research in schools and communities. That would be one way of engaging young people right from the beginning. Peace education is a great way to get young people involved. Supporting them through mentoring and going out and do peace projects is another way, purposeful participation. E, education matters. And, as was very much highlighted here, education can be part of the problem as well as part of the solution. So it depends what particular type of it. I'm talking to the preacher here, you know a lot about that, you know. What type of education are we talking about? Um, and I think there's a role there for education that works the head, the heart, the hands, and I'm going to say something about that shortly, but not just intellectual. Intellectual development is very, very important, but how do we go about providing an education space where we can cater for and address the formation and the development of the whole person? The head, the heart, and the hands. And I've, I've looked into critical education, and I like this idea of Often when we're thinking of education, we think, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? What we're going to do could be, what content are we going to teach? It's really important. How could be, how are we going to teach it? Which would be the form, which would be the pedagogical approach. Really, really important questions for educators. I actually think the most important question is not the who or the how, or not the how or the what, it's why. The question of why should be the driver for all educational um, endeavors, in my opinion. Because once we have a better understanding of the purpose, what is education for, 
and in what particular context and for which particular learners, then we can better look at what should education, what content should we provide? And what should the pedagogical approach be? If you look at Gert Biester, who I'd recommend, critical educator, he would say education serves three purposes. One, there is a need for education to offer qualifications. We're in the job market and we need to have qualifications. The other two, and I'm paraphrasing it, one is to help people understand their place in the world. So to understand the policies and procedures around them that inform their life. The other third one is to help people change the policies and procedures around them. Okay, so how do we go about shaping and being shaped by the policies and procedures? Authentic relationships really, really matters as well. If a young person wants to get involved in peace building work, they're more likely to do that if they feel trust, if they have a trusting environment. So here's the issue. In an educational environment, if you have a short amount of time and you're very, very pressured, that is difficult to do. It's difficult to build a trusting relationship with somebody. So here is an argument for actually acknowledging that time, uh, building trust takes time and funders and people that support these programs need to recognize that and allocate more time for these relationships to be developed. Context matters as well. All contexts are different. So a, perhaps a peace education program in Bolivia would look very, very different to a peace education program in Syria with young people. A peace education program with adults, we know this as well. I've also found as well this idea of um, local and international in interaction, hybridity. So with, 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 in the past, very much with my Friarian or Rogerian hat on, I would very much go into the context and basically say, I'm not here to, to teach anything. I'm here to facilitate a learning environment for you. Okay? Until, and I wrote about this in my PhD and the, the up and coming uh, chapter with Ed, people challenged me and pushed me back and said, actually, we want to be taught things as well. So I think there's a role for both facilitating learning and for teaching as well. Particularly if you look at the peace education field, a lot of talk is about facilitating learning. I think rightly so. However, if you do come at another angle, the likes of Gert Biester, who I quite like, and um, Michael Young, they make an argument for getting rid of this idea of learning. We can talk about this for a long time, but I'm just putting it out there, what they say. And they say, no, let's go back to education. And education is there to teach people new things, not just to facilitate learning. I could talk about this for a long time, but I won't go there. Um, enable interaction as well. I find it really, really useful to bring young people together with adults and to learn together doesn't often happen, actually, but I find it really, really useful. I'm going to show a few things about it shortly. This idea of north-south knowledge exchange and interaction as well has been really, really useful. Often, it might be the case that people from the global north would go out to the global south and teach, this is how you do things. OK, I'm being a bit flippant here, right? But I find it very, very useful to have an exchange and learn together. So my idea now, having been away in, on the ground for many years is to come back here and to look at how do we go about sharing some of the things that we've learned elsewhere here and facilitate that exchange. Theory practice we know about, a great way to engage um, interge intergenerational discussion is to get people working on projects. If you ever have a task in terms of, okay, oh, we've got some conflict in this team, or we've got some conflict in this group going on, one great way to get them working together is get them working on a project together. Because that's they have to pull together. And in the end, it's great to watch the, you know, the interaction. I think this is what this is one area as well. Research-based practice, there's very much a need for that to have our practice informed by research. Very, very much a need for that. I think there's more of a need for this, evidence-based practice. So using research to inform our practice but also look at the work that we're doing in the classroom and look at our own way of being with the students and get the students also to tell us how our own way of being is, is informing the work that we're doing. Okay? So something about looking at yourself as the facilitator and also the people that you're working with. So you might be thinking, well, sounds good, Phil. I'm very, very sure you know all this. I'm very, very sure. But how do we do that? 
So I, I want to look at now this idea of a model that I've been putting together. And I've used variants of it over the years in different countries and different contexts. So both schools, colleges, universities, community groups, with young people 15 to 18 and young people 18 to 13, supported by the community. This model is going to unfold in three different ways. At the core of it is putting young people at the centre. Putting young people at the centre of research, education, action and advocacy. So I'm going to, it's going to unfold in three particular ways. So how do we do that? We'll first of all start off by training young people to be researchers. And this is this idea of youth participatory action research. So train themselves to go out into the communities and do surveys, go out into their schools and facilitate focus groups to find out what's going on in the schools, what's going on in the community. So it's this idea of doing research with people, not about them, around opportunities related to peace and security. With a better understanding of the issues from a youth perspective, and at the end of the day, they'll be on the receiving end, we can then begin to develop educational programs which really address what people want rather than outsiders coming in and saying, this is what education should be like in Argentina or, or Cambridge, for example. Yeah? I'll say something about the education part shortly. And then young people take what they've learned in the classroom and then do projects in the community, which would address issues related to peace and security. After they've done the projects, they then have a platform to present their work to the wider community. So to give you one example of a six-month project in Argentina, we did two celebration events. There was 800 people there, including the mayor, including the head of education. The young people were provided with a platform to present their ideas. And it is so powerful when you hear young people speaking about, this is what I did, and this is what I learned, and this is how I took what I learned and tried to make a change in the community. So you might be thinking, has Phil done that right? Why has he got to, who's this in the corner? Yeah. Are you probably thinking, why has Phil got Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head in the corner? Okay. So I think this is a very useful way of thinking about education. Okay. So I'm sure all of you have heard about this idea of working the head, the heart, the hands of education. So the head would look at the theories, the ideas, the concepts, the intellectual development. The heart would look at the development of you as a person and how you interact with others, your way of being, as Carl Rogers might, certainly might call it. And then the hands is, right, let's take this learning and let's do something about it. Okay? So I often use this one as a great way of saying, when I'm working with people, if you walk out of this class or this university or this time together, as Mrs. or Mr. Potato Head, we have done you a disjustice. And what I mean by that is that you'd be walking all head and out of balance. What we want in today's education is development of the whole person. And I know, Hilary, you wrote a lot about this as well. How do we go about doing that without just focusing on the head? The head part is important, but so is the heart and other parts. So that is why I use this kind of idea of don't walk out like Mrs. Potato Head or Mr. Potato Head. In the workshops that we do, so let me give you one picture of, a f um, I've done at least 10 projects like this, okay? Start off with workshops, two workshops, nine till four, working the head. Then we have a week off or two weeks off, come back and have a Friday and Saturday working the heart. One day looking at the inner part, so looking at ways of being with self, so mindfulness, reflective practice, and then another day, ways of being with others, active listening, focusing, and things like this, things drawn from my background in counseling and, and psychotherapy. Then two days, project management, supporting young people to do projects, where they go from design through to implementation through to evaluation. So that happens in the space of four to five weeks. Then they have the six weeks to go out and do the projects. I'm going to show you some examples shortly. In terms of the head part, we look at, we look at four core concepts. Hmm. Power, conflict, violence, and peace. 
Conflict is often the starting place because conflict isn't good or bad. Conflict is. Everybody has conflict. So the, the challenge is not the fact that we have conflict. The challenge is what we do with it. And we can choose to deal with it by using our power in negative ways or positive ways. Negative ways, positive ways, through peaceful means. And as you know, I'm sure you know a lot about... Can you put your hands up if you've heard of negative, positive peace? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I know, Hillary's, but Hillary's got a book, by the way. <laughs> okay, and peacekeeping, peacemaking, peace building. Okay, so I won't preach to the choir here. You know a little bit about this. The way in which I think about it is negative peace is necessary but not sufficient. So we need to work on both negative and positive peace. That's my perspective, but I'll, you can tell me more about it after. <laughs> um, violence, Johan Galton. We take young people through the process of understanding different forms of violence, and they actually use that as a framework to look at what are some of the issues in Cambridge? Where do we see direct violence playing out? Where do we see cultural violence? Where do we see structural violence playing out? Use many different lenses. One lens to look at a conflict is the conflict tree to look at the, the roots of a problem and the effects of an issue. Here's an example here. Every single project we've done in collaboration with schools and universities. This is in collaboration with um, Virginia Tech in the US, where we train the professors to start with, to then support the students to, and here they are doing a conflict tree exercise, looking at the issues. We went into, I don't know if you know about Charlottesville, what was going on in Charlottesville. I was there a month later after everything that happened. That was an interesting time to go into Charlottesville. So they map the, the who, what, when, why, etc., of the conflict. Here's a young person presenting what they came up with in Charlottesville in particular. Here they are working on a project. Here's the young people, and it works in such a way that the young people are supported and guided and coached by mentors. We look at this issue of war, which I think has kind of come, gone away a little bit in peace, peace and conflict studies to some extent, but I'd love to talk to you about it later, but I think it's gone away a little bit, and I think, it's, I think there's room for it to come back in. We look at the war system, how it erodes, how it impoverishes, how it threatens our environment, and there's massive in interlinkages between the war, with, between war and climate change. Massive, massive, massive. We look at something called the pe peace and violence spectrum. So, for example, in this particular room, peace that side, violence that side, we get people to stand up and we'll say, Okay, over the last 70 years, has the world got more peaceful or more violent? Stand on that spectrum. And then we have a discussion about it. Start with perspectives, and then we present some of the research. So the Institute for Economics and Peace have the world-leading methodology. I didn't touch anything yet. Have the world-leading methodology for measuring peace in the world. They use um, indicators measuring 163 countries around the world. So we work with young people to use those particular indicators to think about how peaceful the world is and how peaceful their country is. And again, it's, it's the world leading methodology, but it has its critiques as well. So that is a very universal methodology. There's other methodologies that I like called the everyday peace indicators if you're looking at something very, very context specific. Positive peace. So here is where we basically train young people in active listening, in mindfulness, in reflective practice. So this is very much the heart work. And then we work with young people to think about, here's a balloon exercise. Write down what you care about in your community and write down what you're concerned about as a starting point before they look at their projects. Here's one example. Hopefully it works, the volume. It opened my eyes and changed me for the better. I didn't realize how complex peace really is. I've thought before about how to help build peace. Now I feel like it's easy. I've already tried some of the exercises with friends and family and initiated a peace project in our club at school. Will there be more training like this for us and for more students? These are just some of the overwhelmingly positive responses that followed the Turn Empathy into Action Peace Conference and Workshop, hosted February 8th and 9th, 2018. At this event, nearly 200 students from 30 plus high schools across the country participated. More than 20 Rotarians trained as conversation leaders were part of the experience. Nearly 75 
percent of participants represented Interact, Junior Rotarians, Rotary Youth Exchange, or Rotaries. Rotary District 5890 sponsored it all and provided scholarships for students and recognition of conflict resolution and peace as a key focal area for Rotary International. And Rotary Peace Fellows Patricia Schaefer and Dr. Phil Gibbons Future Peace Builders Design facilitated. And so, what really happened? Can anything tangible come out of peace building training with young people? Over two intensive, interactive days, participants journey from the heart of peace building to critical thinking and the head of peace building to the hands of peace building, including visualization and definition of 20 peace project ideas that can be incubated by the students, Rotarians, and local community leaders. They practice empathy and connection through icebreakers and eye contact, distinguish direct, structural, and cultural violence through use of Gautam's Triangle of Violence framework, reviewed case studies of high school and university students who have already worked on team action peace projects in other places, and used hundreds of data points and a concept map exercise to understand drivers of conflict in Greater Houston that are related to five key areas. Environment pollution, gun violence, homelessness, human trafficking, and intolerance. They learned that if they, as young people in Greater Houston, one of the largest and most diverse cities in the U.S., if they can develop action peace projects, they have the potential to inspire the rest of the country, and maybe even young people in other countries. Today's young people have unprecedented awareness of global issues. They simply need support to make peace happen. So there's, there hopefully gives you one example. Sometimes I can imagine it's, it's difficult to picture, okay, he's talking a lot, but physically, how does that work, you know? So that gives you one example. We've got other videos to show you if, you, if you'd like. This was a two-day workshop that we put together for 200 young people. Um, the other big project that we talk about that we've run about 10 times now in various different countries takes place over three months and the, you know, the workshops that we spoke about. But I wanted to give you an idea of how it works. So here's some of the places that we've worked in or that we're due to. Actually, I need to update this because we've got a project in po Poland, hopefully. Um, so we've run this in many different places. Um, so that hopefully gives you an idea of how you go about putting young people at the center. Um, to a, a different degree, we've involved young people as researchers, so young people would research their issues in their community. The biggest project that we did, where really we trained young people to be researchers and, and they went out there and we worked together and did PA, was um, part of my PhD, uh, which took place in Bolivia. Okay? But it's not just about young people. It's about providing that support mechanism and that platform where we can support young people to be peace builders. We find actually that in order to train young people, equip young people to be peace builders, it doesn't just have implications for young people, it has impl implications for professionals working with young people. So wherever we've gone, we've trained the community and we've worked with, like I said, schools, colleges, universities, Rotarians, can you put your hand up if you've heard of rot Rotary before? Okay, okay, great, great. So Rotary's mission is to increase goodwill, peace and understanding. Rotary is, um, they have about 1,200,000 members worldwide. They have 36,000 clubs. I'm not a Rotarian, so I'm not, not doing a sales pitch here for Rotary. I'm a Rotary Peace Fellow, so I've worked on these projects with Rotary. Often the funding has come from Rotary in the past. Okay? So we train the Rotarians up to act as mentors when the young people go and do their projects. For example, to, to be concrete, if you have a cohort of 30 young people, generally there'd be about seven young people on one particular cohort that would go and do a peace project. They would have one or two mentors that would support them in this journey. It's the role of the mentor each week to check in with that young person, that young, that young group, of, group of young people, at least once a week. Okay? And they would be updating what was, what was the progress made, what were some of the challenges, and what needs to be done for the next week. So kind of general project management skills. Okay? I'm going to be democratic here. I could show you a video or... 
I really wanted to leave a lot, 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 a lot of time for questions and discussions and for me to hear from you. So you tell me, do you want to see another video of how this works in terms of training Rotarians, training the community, and what happens at the end in terms of the peace projects and the big community celebration? Or would you prefer to, let's have a discussion, Phil, and let's have a talk about it. What do you think? Hands up who prefers to see the video. OK. Hands up who prefers to, let's have a chat, Phil. OK, perfect. I think it's a democratic decision here. <laughs> so this video um, basically shows how we go about mobilizing the community to support young people. I want to leave a lot of space. Oh, so there's three levels. Start with young people, so impact on young people. Then an impact on the local community, as in training them and strengthening their capacities to support youth peace building projects. A third level. At the end, where they've done the peace projects, there's this community celebration. It's a real opportunity to advocate for youth peace building work. Okay? And when I have more time, um, I want to sit down and start writing about this in some particular way. But I'm sure we can all uh, you know, relate to that, having the time to sit down and write about it. So we've done some advocacy work um, last year. Um, I was at the Alliance for Peace Building, where I did a similar panel. Um, 600 peace builders there and we advocated on Capitol Hill and there's an impeding um, legislation coming out for youth peace and security in the US so watch this space and hopefully it will trickle down into the UK let's see let's, let's do some, some questions and answers what do you think we've got a lot a lot of nice time I'm happy about that so, um, yeah, well, first of all, I want to thank you so much for all your wonderful actively listening, and uh, thank you so much for your participation. And um, please, yeah, questions. Um, Phil, would you like me to uh, share this bit, or are you happy to take the questions? I mean, you, whatever you think's best, Hilary, whatever's, I'm easy. Yeah, you, you tell me. Yeah, I think it sounds, if, if that's okay for everyone, is that okay for everyone? Free flow? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so who wants to go first? Questions, thoughts, comments, critiques? Yeah? I've done this before, <laughs> running around. <laughs> first of all, thank you so much for your talk. It was very engaging. Um, so one question that I'm interested in hearing more about your idea of how you set up the workshops, right? So you're dividing um, head from heart from hands and you treat them separately. Um, but they're also very integrated. So how, if you separate them so much, how do you then bring them together? Um, that's the first part. And then the second part, a lot of the exercises or the work that you described seems super relevant. Uh, but I can also see how, aside from ha having working with youth, this can serve just as well with adults, right? So in what way do you really differentiate your approach when you're working with young people as to other people? Wow, two fabulous questions. Thank you so much. So let me just check if, I, if I've got you right. What the first question was, was in relation to the head, the heart, the hands. Um, we separate them in terms of workshops, but actually we don't just wake up in the morning and I'm gonna be head today, you know, and forget our heart. So how do we integrate them? And then, um, yeah, the second one is, how do we tailor it for particular groups? For example, younger people, schools or adults and things like this. I just check I've got, got it right. Brilliant question. So the first one about the head, the heart, the hands, um, it's something we've thought of a lot in terms of how we do this. And we think that there's a great way of culminating in working all three. We start off with the, the head. Um, and actually, we've, we've played about with it. Sometimes we started with the heart, with the social emotional well-being to start with, and then, and then look at the harder stuff in terms of, you can think of it in terms of hard and soft skills. Hard skills looking at the, you know, the conflict analysis and the theories. And then the soft skills looking at how do you go about being in relationships. We think it all comes together when they do their peace projects. And we think it all comes together when they do their peace projects in this way. There's certain principles that they have to follow which are informed by participatory action research, such as nothing about us without us, such as doing projects with the community, not about them, such as in the first week when they're doing their projects, they have to go out and they have to listen to the community and test their idea. 
So there's a big thing around human-centered design at the moment. I don't know if you're aware of that, but it's very much aligned to that kind of way of being. So in order to do that, they have to go out there not with the solution. They have to go out there asking questions and listening. So we think that's a good way of looking at the head and the heart. The head because they're doing research, and the heart because they want to be in relationship with the community. So that's one way of getting at your question. The second question um, relates to, yeah, we, we try and adapt our approach. For example, working with schools, we don't do so much in terms of conflict analysis. We go deeper when we work with university students in terms of a conflict analysis. In terms of working with universities as well, we do more in the way of case studies than what we would with high school students. So there's two different examples. And I just want to say something about how we go about preparing for it. Every single project that we do, we start off with a community assessment, reaching out to the community, including Rotarians, etc., to find out what the needs are in the, in the context. And we try as best as we can to tailor it. So for example, in Charlottesville, there was issues around political uh, polarization and things like this. Where in Bolivia, there was issues around Bolivia at the time had the most amount of gender violence in Latin America, so we did a, a focus on this. Two great questions. I hope I've tried and answered to some extent. Good questions, great questions. Uh, where do I put the thing now? Oh, <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Um, so I work for War Child UK um, and coordinate all their youth engagement. Um, but I was wondering, sort of, youth are often seen as like a homogenous group, usually assumed to have very sort of liberal views. Um, and obviously this isn't true when we're working with young people on the ground. So sort of two things. How do you ensure the inclusive um, selection of participants for your workshops and manage conflict between sort of their assessments of where conflict is coming from in their community? Yeah. Wow, some amazing, amazing questions. Thank you. So before I answer those two questions, so um, Eleanor, Warchild, Holland. Right, I'm do, okay. Yeah, oh, yes. I, do you know Eleanor from, from Warchild? Okay, so she manages the youth, apparently, for Warchild, oh, Holland. Eleanor, yes. Eleanor, Sorry, Eleanor, yes. Eleanor, yes. <laughs> yes, so it just made me think of that. So with regards to, yes, they're not a homogenous group, um, it, very much issues with regards to labelling this young person's victim, perpetrator, and things like this. So I agree with you. I don't know what more I can say about that, you know, in terms of treating them in a person-centred way. So trying to understand where the young people are coming from, you know, um, that would be one way. Um, how do you manage the conflicts within the group? Um, hmm. Well, in terms of selection, there's a process that we go through. So we reach out to the schools and we reach out to the universities and they fill out an application form. But it's really interesting. And this is, I want to share this experience. I don't know if you have this experience as well. But um, we asked them to fill out an application form and they, they would answer questions like, what's your understanding of peace? You know, um, have you been involved in any projects and things like this? We found across the board in doing this in many different places that men tend to write a lot more no, the other way around. Guys tend to write, yeah, interest in peace, you know, and where females would write a lot more. So that's difficult when you're looking through the process deciding who would be the great young people to work with in terms of leaders, you know. So we reach out to the school teachers and we say, look, this, this person has written a little bit here. What's your take on, you know, their, their work and you know whether they'd be a great candidate for this particular work. Here's one challenge in the spirit of being honest. We tend to get the leaders that, that tend to come to this particular program and we still haven't cracked the code, so I'd love your opinion on it. How do we reach the people that are really difficult to reach? And how do we do it in such a way that's voluntary? I haven't cracked the code on that, so I'd love your thoughts on that. You know? So I hope that answers kind of some of your question. The conflict bit, say a little bit more about that. I understand what you mean by the conflict part. When we're doing uh, conflict assessments in communities, we've got young people, and we're really trying to work with like children. Mr. B and I'm sorry. I'm oh yeah, sorry. Oh. Um, sorry, <laughs> we work with children who might have been in armed groups or uh, out of school, maybe working in the worst forms of child labour, and we try and bring them into the groups. Then when they assess the community and sort of find where um, sort of the conflict is coming from, 
you can find that there are some quite deep rooted sometimes social norms of where the who's responsible for the different conflicts and that can lead to some quite uh, animated arguments between young people on who's responsible for the conflict mm -hmm. and I wonder when you're doing this do you look at where the responsibility for the conflict lies or do you look at sort of more from a how are we going to build peace rather than deconstruct the conflict? Mm. Yeah, it does make sense and that's, a, that's another great question. Um, so it, we do a conflict analysis and it's young people that do the conflict analysis themselves but we all know we all have our lenses for seeing the world, right? We put young people first, so we have a bias to working with young people. So we don't know so much about what's going on out in the community and it's not really our role that's coming in from outside to do that kind of work. So we try and support young people to look at things in critical ways, to look at their own role, to look at other groups involved. That would be part of my answer. It's probably not a full answer, but that's part of my answer to your question. Yeah, thank you. But let's have a chat about it, yeah. Thanks, thank you. Oh, sorry, was it, yeah? Oh. Okay. Um, uh, no, thank you so much. And I guess um, a question I had was, so we used to run a, a lot of similar human-centered design workshop for young people over a year where they did their projects, but there were always issues with what happens after the program has ended, what happens, how do you sustain um, sort of that environment as well as the spirit that was in ignited through the workshops and the project. And of course, when they go back to communities that are quite violent, when they have been had, they've been on a transformative journey, but everything around them has remained the same. So yeah, how do you sustain, um, and based on the work that you've done, if you followed up with the students a couple of years after and what that's been like? Yeah, love, love you. Can I ask you, what you have done then, if you've been involved with them, what's, what, what you've done in the past before I provide an answer to that? Um, so of course, they were year-long programs that we ran uh, that were centered around a lot of non-violent communication modules and project development. So of course, one way was following on the projects. A lot of it fizzled out because the average age was 22 when people are still figuring out who and where they want to uh, be. But um, it, I guess uh, one way was just understanding how the person approaches. So it was a very personal, qualitative uh, way of looking at their personal experiences as opposed to assessing their um, how they've been transformed by their project. That was one way we looked at it. But yeah, it's been very difficult. And we've seen how they've taken initiative in their communities and if they've created larger networks out of this. But it was, it's still a challenge. And we haven't figured it out. Yeah, well, I was thinking you're going to crack the code then. I was thinking, I'm listening, so you can tell it. I think, I think I agree, it's a challenge. So there's ch challenges around sustainability. There's ch challenges around you know, the impact. So what is the impact? And that's a big question for all of us, right? Are we looking at the impact on the young person themselves in terms of their transformation, their learning, their development, et cetera? Are we looking at the impact on the community, which is a lot more difficult to, to, to assess? Are we looking at the impact of the particular projects? That's another one. In relation to your question about what happens after it all finishes, it's a, it's a challenge. What we've done in the past is that we've trained them up to be ambassadors and they have actually gone out into their schools and universities and recruited other young people. And then when the cohorts are run, we've actually trained them to be mentors and conversation leaders in the class. So they're involved in that way. Uh, we have definitely not cracked the code, but that is one way in which we're thinking about it so far. On a, in the spirit of being completely honest as well, um, the projects that we've done in the past have been very project based. So we'd go in for three months and then we'd go out again. Now that I'm back in England, I'm interested in starting my own kind of venture, which builds off all the work, connects with the Global Camp for Peace Education, will be on war and the work that I do there, but looks at more a permanent program. So rather than a three-month project-based, how do we go about providing a centre or a place, an incubation for youth-led peace projects? I'm in the exploration stage, so I'd love your thoughts on that. Anybody's thoughts on that, please, please let me know. Yeah? Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm interested in doing like PAR stuff in schools, um, work with kids um, specifically that are at risk of exclusion and that sort of stuff. Uh, and kind of, so obviously, like with PAR, it kind of comes from the kind of critical theoretical perspective, and you know, to develop critical consciousness and all this sort of thing. How do you kind of take into account the fact that that can be that can develop into being like a subversive presence within schools and so schools don't see 
because schools is that you know it's the institution and they often schools don't want to change too much mm -hmm. but if you're going in and trying to develop this kind of this change in the kids how do you deal with that with the school yeah. without being like overly subversive but still getting the kids to where still helping the kids reach that yeah yeah, well, another, another, another great question. I mean, I'm sure Hillary could talk a lot to that about how going into schools and looking at whole school approach. But in terms of power, there's one thing worth pointing out is power is about changing things, isn't it? Where other research is about uh, understanding. So power goes in with the intention, we are here to change things for the better. And actually, we think that the best way of bringing about change is by actually trying something, reflecting on it, and things like this. I think it comes down to, in terms of who you're working with and being very transparent about the, this is how we want to try this particular work. I didn't go in in the work in the past with this uh, framing it in such a way that I would like to do a participatory action research with you as a school. So, but moving forward, I really want to focus more on this idea of participatory action research because I think it's a real need and, a, and really beneficial for young people, for the community as well. So let's stay in contact and I'll let you know how it goes moving forward and please let me know and let's be in conversation about your progress as well and if we can be in collaboration in any way, I'd love that, Brilliant. for sure. And, and Hilary mentioned earlier about this, um, uh, an article just come out doing, um, doing participatory action research as a doctoral student in peace and conflict studies. That, that might be of interest if you want to have a look at that. Hi, thank you. Um, this is actually a really research-based question, just in terms of uh, when you are talking about the approach, are you looking at it from an emancipatory theory or a transformative theory? Are you making up your own theory? I'm just wondering, because we have to write something like this. So it's interesting <laughs> about um, what ha how you're framing, because you say it's very theory-based, how you're framing this part. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a good question that I will have difficulty answering fully. Um, so power is about emancipation, and it's about taking a critical approach. Um, but at the same time, I come from a very Rogerian perspective, Carl Rogers, and he was against theory in the dogmatic sense, in terms of theory should inform everything that you do. He, he talked about um, ways of being. And he said that actually we can take a philosophical grounding to, to our relationships and all the relationships that we develop, but our way of being would be fresh with every single person. But we have the principles of uh, his, his core conditions, and I can come back and talk about that another time, but you know, understanding, so t em empathy, congruency, so being authentic in the relationship, which sounds easy, is probably the most difficult out of the whole three. The third one, he called it unconditional positive regard. But it's a way of saying prizing and warm in, in, in your relationships with others. So your question about emancipation and um, transformation, these are all big words that are used in different ways within the peace and conflict studies field. Um, if you follow down the, the participatory action route, then you, you are interested in changing things, in emancipation, in transformation. Um, I think I tend to look at Foucault would talk about theory in terms of a toolbox. I take a theory if it works. If it doesn't work, then don't use it. You know, a theory could be a sense that it works everywhere or actually doesn't work anywhere. And I've really found through, through trial and error that a person-centered approach as a theory has been very, very useful for my relationships when I'm working as a therapist, when I'm working as a, a facilitator, when I'm working as a peace builder, when I'm in, hopefully I'm trying, in personal relationship with my wife as well, to try and be in relationships, you know, in understanding caring ways. But great question. You really put me on the spot there. Great question. No, it's, um, thank you. Thank you so much for it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, where should we go? Thank you. Um, so with your, with your model, kind of the three levels, um, I see that, you know, very in your formal training. And I'm just wondering, in non-formal settings, you know, in sports teams and summer camps, how can we draw in some of these, these ideas um, into, you know, maybe other places that, that adults and, and young people interact? Yeah, that's another great, you have some great questions. You have some great, great questions. So remember that really my grounding is very much in informal education to start with. You know, so that's very much my baby and where I started. So I really love this idea of non-formal, informal. Although 
this model has, we've been working with schools and working with universities. It's always been extracurricular. Basically, this, the, the young people have had the day off on Friday to do it. So it hasn't been embedded within the school curriculum or within the university curriculum. So we think it is still in terms of non-formal. In terms of sports and things like this, I don't know, you perhaps know a lot better about that than me. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. But I think this is a model, a way of not just peace education, not just peace building. It's a way of putting young people at the centre. The, and putting young people at the centre could be putting young people at the centre of um, work around mental health, putting young people around at the centre of work around peace and security, putting young people at the centre around climate change, you know, and how you go about working with them to involve them in research, education, action and advocacy. So although the lens has been used in this case, peace, I think actually it's a useful model to, to look at using it in other contexts, um, and other fields as well, maybe, I think. That's part of an answer to your question, yeah. Thank you, Phil. Uh, I really think what you do is incredible. Uh, my question is, given the interconnectedness of life on Earth and given that affecting change would require us to see people, histories, cultures as like inextricably connected and linked to larger power dynamics, global dynamics, to what extent do you think we should move beyond restricting our talk when we talk about contexts like UK and US, talking about knife and crime, to involving young people in these countries in the destructive role of, of their countries maybe in perpetuating violence in other parts of the world? Mm, great questions here, you. Yeah, that's another great question. Um, one thing I found is, uh, it's in order to answer part of that question, is that where I go to different places, young people are very interested in hearing about what happens outside as well. I find that that's been, that's been very, very interesting. And they've found it very beneficial to look at, oh, what work has been done elsewhere and things like this. So in a way, this gets at this contextualization question because, and I'm interested in this, should, should, con should peace education, if we're looking at that through that lens, be context specific, you know, 100%. Should you just be focusing on what happens in, let's take an example, Northern Ireland, okay, where it's put under the umbrella of education for mutual understanding because they think that's the best way of working in Northern Ireland. But I think there is way, and actually they do do this as well, that look at, okay, so this is what's happening in Northern Ireland, but actually is there similarities what's going on in Israel, Palestine, and other contexts as well? So I, th I think there is ways of looking at yeah, the, the, we are all interconnected and that we can learn from different environments. Yeah, I think I agree. Um, how we go about doing that on a large scale is the next challenge. <laughs> yeah. Questions? I know we're coming up to half past, but I'm happy to take questions. And, and tell me your thoughts as well, please, you know. So, oh. I'm going to be one of those people who's like, it's less of a question and more of a comment, but on the back of what Phoenix said, um, there's an organisation called Peace Players, which works with basketball to create peace. I just thought it was very, because they work in Northern Ireland and also between Israel and Palestine. So to get people from like different communities to come together and play basketball. Really? Okay, well, I'll check that. Yeah, I, actually, I and you probably know a lot about this as well, but I'm seeing a lot of movement right now in the field with regards to the connection between peace and sports. I don't know if other people are seeing that, but I'm seeing a lot of movement around that. And um, one of my, who's a lovely person, but my PhD examiner was Tom Woodhouse um, and Hugh Mile. But Tom is very much looking at that sports and peace now that he's retired from Bradford, but he's very much focusing on. So if you do have an interest in sports and peace, you might want to look at his work as well. Other questions? You have some great questions here. You didn't tell me that they had brilliant questions here, Basma and Hilary. They were amazing questions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, what would you see as competing um, processes for, to your own for bringing peacekeeping to schools? Do you mean as in other organisations? Other organisations, other methods. What do you see as competing with this? There's some amazing work being done around the world. Okay, so one amazing program I think is very, very good is Peace Jam. Um, you might have heard of Peace Jam. Um, very much framed in, in, in the way of learning from Nobel Peace Prize winners um, and bringing that into schools. Um, so that would be one. 
Um, another one um, would be, I don't know about competition, I always like to think in terms of collaboration. I think the Quakers do some great work as well, and I'm meeting them on, fr on Friday as well to talk about a potential collaboration. Um, they have reached out to me as well and said, I think we do some good work in schools. We're really interested in hearing about how you go about connecting schools with community work and vice versa. Um, so that would be another one. There's an organisation called, um, who I've just been put in contact, they reached out to me, Leap, Leap, who are in London, which work with um, young people and their focus is, the starting point is looking at conflict and training young people to deal with conflict. I think one of the issues though, and I wrote about this in, in my PhD and we'll write about it elsewhere when I get time, is that a lot of it is not context specific and not developed with the communities themselves. So when I looked around the peace education field, I find that there's an issue of, in, perhaps peace education is better than peace and conflict studies, but if you look at the peace building field, the likes of Oliver Richmond and McGinty and other authors there all talk about this problem of imposition from outside. But when I look at what happens on pra in practice, to what extent are organizations working with the community to really understand what the peace education or peace building offering should be, I don't see that always happens in practice as well as it could. So that would be my take on it. But I think there's some wonderful, wonderful work and some wonderful scholars, you know, some of the ones that I've mentioned, um, the likes of Alan Smith, brilliant um, scholar, uh, Mika in, in Amsterdam, uh, Mario Novelli, who was here as well, doing some amazing work around this thematic of education. Hillary, <laughs> doing some amazing work around peace education. Um, so amazing, amazing work being done. So uh, we've, we've come up to 1.30, so it's probably uh, a, a good time to take you out of the spotlight. And uh, we are uh, going to go and have something to eat and continue conversations. We're going over to Homerton, if anybody um, would like to come and, uh, and join us. Can I say a huge thank you, Phil, for uh, coming here to share with us today and for stimulating us to think about the intersections between theory, policy, practice, as well as the connections between youth, intergenerational work, communities, such important work and very inspirational for young people who are going out to begin careers in these areas, as well as, uh, as you've heard, some people who are continuing to do uh, the most amazing work in these, er in, in, in these areas. Um, so thank you for your, for your contribution and for your inspiration. Thank you, everyone, for coming and participating and asking such uh, great questions. So again, could we end by expressing our sincere thanks to Phil. Thank you.